Hi all, am I audible? Shall we begin the session? Can someone respond in the chat box, guys? Shall we begin the session? Hi all, am I audible? Yes. So, okay. So we are at the stage where we are just preparing ourselves for uh, doing this exam very well. And uh, I think uh, you have more 15 or 20 days left on. So no worries. So let me give my own inputs how I prepared basically for next uh, five minutes before we are starting into the last minute discussion of uh, respiratory physiology. So basically, like uh, divide yourself, like which all the topics you have already studied. So divide like topics already studied. Okay, wow. so notebook at the Konga already Edalam Padichirikinga Abdint list it out. And uh, other side, you just attempt some uh, questions, just see the old question paper. Previous year question papers are very important. Okay, previous year questions, Ella check Pani Paranga. You have uh, lots of uh, EMEDQ app. So go to the EMEDQ app and uh, see what are the questions that are asked for your seniors so that it gives you some idea how to prepare ourselves for the exam. Okay, so previous year question paranga. Then finally, in the book la padichirikengla already, stick on to that book itself. Okay, stick on to that material. So don't prepare from new materials. So that is totally not needed. Even I prepared from the regular books, whichever uh, we are like uh, everyone are using. So the same textbooks than on a source so that you should not have a confusion at the last moment. Okay, so today we are going to discuss on uh, respiratory physiology. So RS is something uh, which uh, we are like very much confused always. And uh, especially at this point of time when cricket matches are going on, we will be like, uh, which one we should concentrate on. Or one side we will be seeing TV and other side we will be seeing the textbooks. But try to like uh, stick on to your schedule, stick on to the book at least for the next 15-20 days so that it is going to change your life completely. The first year is very, very important. So many people will be telling first year is the base. That's true. First year is subjects, whichever you are going to read, same uh, all those topics you will be reading till your uh, last moment of your medical profession because all these topics are the one that repeatedly comes to you okay so if you go for medicine if you go for surgery if you go for pediatrics everywhere this uh, physiology is going to be playing a major role that's why the physiology is very important and the first year when you're going to step into that forms the basis of all the topics you're going to read in the future so this respiratory physiology Okay, let us go start with the respiratory physiology now. I hope uh, people have started to join. Okay, so very good evening. So today we are going to try to cover respiratory physiology and maximum we will also try to cover the other one that is renal. Okay, so both the things I will try to cover because most of the questions if you are going to see are coming from your respiratory and renal. And CNS is one of the things which I saw in all those models. Okay, CNS we will try to cover. So these three topics, we will keep it on priority on coming next to one, two or three days and we will try to cover them. Okay, so the first question, this is going to be an interactive because already you have completed one year fully and you have read physiology. So let's keep it an interactive session so that you will be having an active recall. So once uh, Dan listening to the lecture, reading a textbook, active recall method is very, uh, in, very important and it will give you a very, uh, what to tell, it will be giving you a lot of memory. Uh, last moment, so we will try to have an active memory. So first question, what are the two, what is the total number of airway division between your trachea and your alveolar tree? Can someone tell it? Can someone tell in the chat box? What is the total number of airway divisions between your trachea and your alveolar tree? Option A, 21. Option B, 22. 23, 24. Can someone put it in the chat box? This is the starting of your physiology, uh, respiratory physiology, guys. Yeah, uh, Benila, 23. Very good. Others? Felix, 23. 
Yes, very good. So as you told, the answer is 23. So what is this? This is actually Weibel's lung model. So this is Weibel's lung model. So your trachea is taken as zero. As you can see in this uh, picture, trachea is actually taken as zero. And then from your uh, trachea till, till your terminal bronchioles, you take it, you give the number 1 to 16. And then from 17 to 23, you are going to have your respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct and alveolar sac. Now tell me why this is important. You will be like uh, wondering why I should learn this. Because this Weibel's lung model divides your entire respiratory uh, system, respiratory anatomy into two zones. One is a conducting zone, other is a respiratory zone. What is conducting zone? So they are incapable of any gas exchange. So they are incapable of gas exchange. So what is the significance of it? It is going to be giving you the anatomical dead space. It is going to give you the anatomical dead space. Now the question comes to you a two mark question or a five mark question. What is anatomical dead space? It is nothing but the conducting zone, the 16 generations starting from your trachea to your terminal, terminal bronchiole. So this is a place where the, they are incapable for gas exchange. Then you have respiratory zone. Respiratory zone consists of seven generations. So it is going to be starting from your 17, that is your respiratory bronchiole, and it is going to end in the alveolar sac. It is going to end in the alveolar sac. Okay, so this area is capable of gas exchange. Okay, so this terminal bronchiole is one which is going to act as a transition point between your conducting zone and your transitional zone. Second question to you all, which of the following has the highest airway resistance? Second question to you all, which of the following as IS airway resistance? Alveolar duct, bronchi, respiratory bronchioles or small bronchioles? Now your answer I want from you all. Can you put in the chat box? Alveolar duct or bronchi or respiratory bronchioles or small bronchioles. Now we have to see all the MCQs. last question papers. Second thing, we are going to frame the five mark question and essays out of this MCQs itself. So that is going to be a very active learning. So I have just put it. Uh, please answer it in the cha chat box. Okay. So which of the following as the highest airway resistance? The answer is bronchi. Oh. So that comes to the poils Egan formula, a confusing formula given in your both your Sembulingam or Guide and whichever textbook you read, GK Paul, they will be mentioning this poisel Hugh formula. What is this poisel Egan formula? poisel Egan formula is nothing but Q is equal to pi into difference in the pressure into radius to the power of 4 divided by 8 into viscosity into length. Okay, sir, why should I remember this? What is the importance of this? This is giving going to give you a relationship. So this is going to give you a relationship. What relationship? Your Q is nothing but the flow rate. Amount of air entering and exiting your lung, that is your flow rate, is directly proportional to the radius is directly proportional to the pressure difference and inversely proportional to the resistance. Okay, so they are inversely proportional to the resistance. What is resistance? So nothing but see here. Resistance is 8 uh, with viscosity L divided by pi R to the power of 4. So derive your resistance is inversely proportional to your radius. So in the question, which has highest airway resistance in Ketraganga? So the question is which has the highest airway resistance? Abdingan question. So what is going to be your answer? With this formula, we think that the smallest airway is going to be the major site of uh, which is going to be the major site of resistance. See, you know, resistance is inversely proportional to ray R so we will think that the smallest airway will be having the highest resistance but the thing is smallest airway is not going to have the highest resistance because the airway branches okay airway branches each generation in parallel so the resistance will be decreasing as we put together you know total cross section area when the path smaller airways compared to the larger airways Upper low smaller airway radius coming in all we cannot tell that the resistance is going to be is there. But since surface area is going to be more in the smaller airways, smaller airways la surface area and area cross section diameter when we all put it together, it is going to be more. Therefore, the smallest airway is not the greatest having the greatest resistance, but trachea is the trachea and the division. That is going to be your bronchi. 
bronchi is, is going to be the one that has highest airway resistance. Okay, now coming to the third question. Can someone put in the chat box? 14 year old boy came with shortness of breath. He is diagnosed with a chronic inflammation of conducting airway, which is not the feature of affected structure. First one, it includes 16 generation of trachea. Smooth muscles of cartilage predominate. Secrete variety of molecules that aid in lung defense and membrane bound organelles. Membrane bound organelles, namely lamellar bodies, are present. So, how we are going to approach this MCQ and approach this concept? See here. The shortness of breath diagnosed with a chronic inflammation, chronic inflammation of conducting airway. What is conducting airway, guys? Conducting airway is conducting zone. First point, la, anatomy, la, nama padicho, conducting zone. Na, another. From your trachea to your terminal bronchiole is called as conducting zone. Upon the conducting airway, la, inflammation. Upon first 16 generation of your trachea includes conducting airway. Than so this is going to be your conducting airway. Upon this is correct. Tha. Okay, wow, this is right. Smooth muscles and cartilage prominent. Yes, always remember the conducting zone is going to have the conducting zone is going to have that is your trachea, bronchi, bronchiole, terminal bronchiole, where you are area and there, they have cartilaginous airway. So cartilage is irukanga. So adinala, they are going to be having, they will never collapse. Okay. So they do not collapse and they remain open. Adinala, that we call it as a anatomical dead space. That we call it as anatomical dead space. This is the second point I want you all to remember. Third thing, paranga, they secrete variety of molecules that aid in lung defense. Of course, yes, they will be secreting variety of molecules. That is the second concept on the book that we are going to discuss now. And membrane bound organelles, namely lamellar bodies are present. So, this is Lamellar bodies are not present in the okay, wa, conducting pathway. So, diagnosis in the case when the actual or asthma cases. So, asthma we will get they can ask you about the lung compliance. So, in the mayor case, could the lung compliance so that we will be seeing it in the upcoming slides. See, lamellar body, it is a storage body of your surfactant. So, a lamellar body, the lamellar bodies are present in the place where alveoli is present. Alveoli is not present in the conducting zone. Correct? Conducting zone, la alveoli is not there. So, upper first on the option, tappu, on the option than tappu. remember, conducting pathway is going to consist of pseudo stratified ciliated column or epithelium. They are going to contain smooth muscles. This smooth muscles are going to be maximum at the terminal bronchiole. Then you have specialized cells. So what are the two type of specialized cell? Number one, you have basal cell. Number two, you have clara. So number two, you are going to have a clara cell or club cells. So this basal cells are going to act as a stem cell. Basal cells are going to act as a stem cell. And clara is going to be uh, club cells. They are specialized. They are going to be specialized. Uh, okay. Uh, they are going to have a specialized cells. So that is your stem cells and lung defense. So in the specialized cells are in develop. One it is going to help in the stem cell formation. Second thing, they are going to act as a lung defense mechanism. So what are the lung defense mechanism? Number one, it is going to produce secretory immunoglobin. So when you are going to inspire, you are not only inspiring the air, but you are also inspiring some bacteria and microbes which are present in the air. So upon the microbes, defense this lung is going to produce IgA. That IgA is called a surface IgA. Okay, epithelium one the produce panu. Okay, wow. immunoglobins that is going to be IgA. Then you have collectins. Collectins is going to produce two important surface protein. Surface protein A and surface protein D. Then you have defensins. Then you have ROS that is going to be reactive oxygen species. Avangada phagocyte pandranga. So any foreign body, any microbe which is entering into your nose, the and the microbes, they are going to destroy it by reactive oxygen species mechanism. Okay, that comes to the end of this physiology. Next, an elderly smoker, acute exacerbation of COPD, administered salbutamol with substance as similar mechanism of action. Can someone put in the chat box, guys? See, so, if you want to this question has been put here, right? So, next concept we are going to move into, what are the nerve supply? So, what is the sympathetic, parasympathetic systems are going to act in your uh, respiratory uh, conducting zone and your say, uh, respiratory zones? Appa, what are the uh, different uh, sympathetic, parasympathetic activity that are going to be present in the lungs? That's what next talk about. See here. So, answer is going to be your vasoactive intestinal peptide. I'll tell you why. 
vasoactive intestinal peptide as a bronchodilator. Remember, guys, it's a bronchodilator. So they are going to act along the dysnorphin. It forms a non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic inhibitory system. What is this non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic inhibitory system? So basically what happens is there are some innervations to your tracheobronchial tree. So tracheobronchial tree, la, there are certain innervations. What are those innervations? You have a parasympathetic system. You have a sympathetic system. Then third thing is going to be both are not there. No parasympathetic, no sympathetic, but there are some inhibitory res response. Whereas there is a, some stimulatory response in the absence of parasympathetic and sympathetic mechanism. Parasympathetic mechanisms are going to cause bronchoconstriction. Sympathetic when they end up on bronchodilator. You would have read already. So what we will be telling when a dog chases you, what you are going to have? You are going to have uh, adrenergic stimulation. Adrenergic causes bronchodilatation. So you need to breathe fast, isn't it? So bronchodilatation and vasoconstriction. Similarly, parasympathetic causes bronchoconstriction, vasodilatation. So we would have read it already in uh, physiology in other part. Now, non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic inhibitory system, the vasoactive intestinal peptide is coming. This is going to cause vasodilatation. So, your bronchodilatation. Similarly, bronchoconstriction by the substance P. So, this is one thing I want you all to remember. Now, coming to the elasticity of thorax. So, you have three important structures. Lung, ko, outside, ko, nadula and the moon important structure. First, you have a chest wall. Okay, chest wall kulla da, you have this so called lungs. Okay, just ignore my uh, drawing. Okay, just ignore my drawing. So, this is going to be your lungs. Okay, so lungs vandu pathangana, it is going to be inside your chest wall. Okay, so between your chest wall and lung, okay, you're going to have a pleura. So, you're going to have a pleura. So, this is going to be pleura. So, this is going to be pleura. Okay, you're going to have Pleura. So you have three important pressures in between. Chest wall is going to be going outward. So while you are uh, while you are breathing, you would have noticed your chest wall goes outward. Same way your lungs goes inward. So chest wall is going to outward elastically. It is going to go outward elastically. Okay. Whereas your uh, lungs is going to go inward. Your lungs is going to go inwards. Okay. Wow. So between this, you have a pleura, isn't it? That is having a pressure. That is called as intrapleural pressure. That is called as intrapleural pressure. That is called as intrapleural pressure. And that will be always negative. I will tell you the reason why it is always negative in the upcoming slide. Okay. Next one, you are going to have another thing that is called as surface tension. Okay, what is the surface tension, guy? See, very easy. You have a water. Okay, you have a water, you have a air. Okay, so you are going to have a water, you are going to have a air. So between them, there is going to be a, what happens? There is going to be a resistance. Okay, there is going to be a resistance. See, what happens? You are going to have an alveoli. So this is your alveoli. This alveoli contains alveolar fluid. This is going to contain alveolar fluid. So when there is going to be a change in the medium from a water to a solid, from a water to a gas, there will be a pressure difference. There is going to be a gradient difference. That gradient is going to be represented as surface tension. That gradient refers to surface tension. So what happens is who is going to produce this water? inside that is going to be alveolar fluid alveolar fluid is produced by your type 1 pneumocyte type 1 pneumocyte so we will be talking about it type 1 pneumocytes are the one that are going to synthesize this alveolar fluid okay next you are going to have another important concept that is going to be your transpulmonary pressure so in the basic concepts now if you are not understanding you cannot understand that uh, respiratory physiology in total okay wow. so any allo just remember any aloe viscous, if you are going to take, okay, so when it is going to expand, any aloe viscous, if you are going to take, when they are going to expand, they are going to have some pressure. So see here, this is going to be your lungs. Okay, so the pressure is going to be, this is going to be like a viscous, this is a viscera. So inside it, you are going to have some pressure that we call it as pressure inside the viscous, inside the viscous, you are going to have a pressure. Similarly, there is going to be a pressure that is going to be present outside. There is a pressure that is going to be present outside. Okay. So, the difference between the pressure inside and pressure outside, you call it as transmural pressure. Transmural pressure. 
Now tell me what is a transmural pressure? Transmural pressure is nothing but transmural pressure is nothing but it is pressure inside pressure inside minus pressure outside. Okay, so if you are very simpler terms, what is transmural pressure? If they ask you, it is a difference between the pressure inside and pressure outside. Now, what is a transpulmonary pressure? Transpulmonary pressure. This is again asked as a question in your exam. What is a transpulmonary pressure? It is a difference between intraalveolar pressure and intrapulmonary pressure. It is a difference between intraalveolar pressure. Okay, minus intra pulmonary pressure now can you understand transmural pressure ko transpulmonary pressure one difference illa pressure inside versus pressure outside nama sonnom la what is inside alveoli what is the pressure that is going to be outside transpulmonary pressure so transalveolar pressure minus transpulmonary pressure gives you the what is it is going to give you the transpulmonary pressure so trans okay transpulmonary pressure na na Intraalveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. It is going to give you, okay, intrapulmonary pressure. It is going to give you transpulmonary pressure. Trans between them. So what is the difference? That we are going to tell. Okay. Now, moving on towards the alveoli. Is it clear, guys? Am I, aud am I audible? Am I clear? Is the flow is okay? So can you just put in the chat box so that it will be making me easier to continue. Uh, these sessions are planned in a very shorter way so that you can write something in your exam. See, the, for exam, what you need is something about everything you need to understand. That is basic concept in all your university exam. At least few words you should be able to write relevant to the question asked to you. If you are writing it relevant, you will be getting good score. If you are not writing and if you are writing something different from the question itself, okay, then it is going to be difficult for you to get good score. So that is the ultimate uh, character examiner's aim for who is going to test your knowledge. Okay, They are not expecting everything to be known to you but something about everything you need to understand. Now, your alveoli is going to be synthesized by two important cells. So for alveoli to be there, you have something called as, see, this is your alveolus. In your alveolus, you are going to have a cell lining and inside that cell lining, you are going to have a fluid. What is this fluid? Alveolar fluid. That's what I told you. Alveolar fluid is synthesized by type 1 pneumocytes. Okay. This type 1 pneumocytes is going to synthesize two things. Water and mucin. So what is the constant consistency or what is the components of your alveolar fluid? Water and mucin. So your type 1 alveolar cells or type 1 pneumocytes, they are going to constitute 95%. Okay, they are going to constitute 95% of total surface area. So it is going to give you 95% of total surface area. It makes your epithelial cell flat. Okay, now you have type 2 pneumocyte. What is this type 2 pneumocyte? Type 2 pneumocytes are the one that produces surfactant. So the surfactants are necessary for reducing the surface tension. So now surface tension on the path on the, and the surface tension, if you are going to reduce only then you will have a good exchange of gases. So on the surface tension, it is done by your type 2 pneumocytes. Okay, surfactant produced pandranga. Surfactant consists of two important components. Number one, you're going to have dipalmetal, palmetal trans carb. Okay, it's going to consist of a very important component, dipalmetal phosphodyl choline. Dipalmetyl phosphodyl choline, or simply we can call it as choline. So, what is this choline mainly consist of? Choline mainly consist of lecithin. This choline mainly consists of lecithin. Lecithin is most abundant of lipids. Okay, it is nothing but a lipid. And you're going to have a sphingomyelin. You're going to have a sphingomyelin. So this constitutes 60% of your epithelial cells. So 60% of epithelial cells are constituted by whom? Your pneumocyte type 2. Okay. So this type 2 cells, they are helping in the replenishing the damage type 1. So type 1 damage on all. The type 2 the is going to help it. And it is going to prevent it from the drug toxicity, mainly in bleomycin drug. So bleomycin is anti-cancer drug. So on the bleomycin kitten, it is going to safeguard your type 1 pneumocytes who type 2 and is there any uh, other cells apart from your type 1 and type 2 pneumocyte if, I, if you ask me there are different cells like your pulmonary alveolar macrophages you have plasma cells you have lymphocytes you have neuroendocrine cells example apud okay apud cells okay it's a neuroendocrine cells and you have mast cells okay this is the constituent of uh, the cells present in your alveolar fluid 
So surfactant is mainly composed of what? Can someone put in the chat box? Surfactant is mainly composed of what? Option A, phosphodiglycerol. Option B, lecithin. Option C, cephalin. Option D, protein. What is the main constituent or main composition of surfactant? So remember guys, the main composition of surfactant is going to be your lecithin. So your surfactant is going to consist of lecithin, phosphodiglycerol, surfactant apoproteins and calcium ions. What is the surfactant apoproteins? Consist of A, B, C and D. Surfactant is a very important 5 mark question that is asked in your exam. What is surfactant? We already told what is surfactant. It is going to be the, uh, it is going to be surfactant is a composed of diphosphodyl, for diphosphodyl, for dipalmitoyl, phosphodyl choline and sphingomyelin. They are produced by type 2 pneumocytes. They reduce the surface tension of the lung. Okay, this surfactant consists of lecithin, phosphodyl glycerol, surfactant apoprotein and calcium ion. Very good, Pooja Kamraj and uh, Agustina, yes. And Kumar, Kamala, everyone, right? Yes, lecithin is a right answer. So what is going to be your surfactant composed of? These are the four things which your surfactant composed of. So the synthesis of your surfactant is going to begin at 24 to 26 weeks of gestation. 24 to 26 weeks of gestation. Different books gives you different answer, but your Ganong gives you this answer. So always follow Ganong or Gaiten. Okay, well, so it is going to be uh, beginning at 24 to 26 weeks of gestation and it is going to become fully functional at 34 weeks. It is going to get fully functional at 34 weeks. So what are the tests that are going to be done to know the fetal lung maturity? So surfactant or uh, amount, if it is not there, then your baby is going to have a respiratory distress once it gets birth, especially on the premature baby the baby born to diabetic mother. So those people, those infants will be having respiratory distress. So they will be having difficulty in breathing. Why? Because of reduced amount of surfactant formed in the intrauterine period. The amount of surfactant formed, we wanted to deduct. How we are going to deduct? Before the birth itself, we will be deducting. When we will be deducting? After the uh, 28 weeks, mainly 28 weeks range, la, surfactant is going to be formed. Apa surfactant amount uh, before uh, pregnancy or hypertension, rikala, illa diabetic mother, some complications, nala, we are going to terminate the pregnancy. Terminate means not uh, aborting, but we are going to induce labor and we are going to deliver the baby. Apa and the deliver agra baby ki respiratory distress irka, abdin, we have to check. Okay, varuma, abdin, nama vandhi, prevention na nama check pan How we are checking by four different tests. Number one, a very simple test that is going to be your lecithin sphingomyelin ratio. Lecithin sphingomyelin myelin ratio. So this lecithin sphingomyelin ratio will be helping you to understand the amount of surfactant present in the baby so that you will be like, uh, it will be easy for you to understand and if at all it is not there, what you can do? You can give steroids to the mother and this steroid will be helping in synthesis of lecithin sphingomyelin in the baby and lecithin may not. Lecithin baby la increase ago. Lecithin increase such na automatic surfactant ruko, so that while terminating or while delivering the baby, the baby will not have respiratory distress. That is the key. So if you are reading, you are, you are memorizing the concepts of surfactant, surfactant, why you are reading about surfactant, why you are reading about lecithin sphingomyelin ratio, we are reading it because this is going to have a clinical implication in your pediatrics, in your medicine, when you are going to go for your final year, this will be helping you. Remember, lecithin sphingomyelin ratio, this should be more than two. Lecithin sphingomyelin ratio, ideally, it should be more than two if your baby should not get respiratory distress. Okay, then you have a shake test. So just know the names of it. Uh, uh, if they are going to ask you about the surfactant, you can end it by writing about the test for fetal lung maturity. You have a shake test, you have a phosphatidyl glycerol test and this one MCQ. This can be asked in your exam. Nile blue sulfate test. Can someone attempt in your chat box, Nile blue sulfate test, you are going to stain something. You are going to stain all those lecithins. So, lecithin is stain panna, yenna color la erko. While you are observing through the microscope, what is going to be the color of your lecithin in your Nile blue sulfate test? Can someone just attempt it? 
Okay, attempt panninga. I will tell you if it is correct or not. So stain of the alanine blue sulfate test will be staining your lecithin, your uh, pneumocytes. Okay, they are going to stain it in what color? Okay, this was asked once as a MCQ. Okay, usually the color we will be thinking is blue color because the name itself it is Nile blue sulfate test. But unfortunately, the examiners are like confusing us because Nile blue sulfate test will like stain in orange color. Nile blue sulfate test will be staining in orange color. It is not blue color. Okay, next, familial intestinal lung, the interstitial lung disease. This familial interstitial lung disease is because of the absence of surface protein, SPC. So we discussed that your surface surfactant apoprotein, there are four different apoprotein, SPA, SPB, SPC, and SPD. You are going to have four different apoproteins. So out of this four different outer apoproteins, this C, when it is absent, that is going to give rise to familial interstitial lung disease. Remember, it is not green, it is orange in color. So your Nile blue sulfate test will be giving orange color cells where you observe in the microscope. So there should be more than 50 percentage of orange color stained uh, okay, cells to tell that the baby is uh, fetal lung has been matured. Okay, this is called as Nile blue sulfate test. That's what I want you all to remember. Okay, next pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. When you will be there, when there is an antibody against this GMCSF, ganglio, okay, you're going to have against the GMCSF, when you're going to have an antibody, you will have pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. Then surfactant prevents alveolar collapse according to what law? This was asked as an MCQ in some models. I have just checked some model paper. This question was there. Surfactant prevents alveolar collapse according to law of Lapace. They have given Bernoulli's law. They have given some other four different laws have been given. But the answer is law of Lapace. What is law of Lapace? Law of Lapace is nothing but the collapsing pressure is equal to 2T divided by R. Okay, wow. so this is the R. So collapsing pressure is inversely proportional to your radius of a large alveoli will have less collapsing pressure. Small alveoli will have more collapsing pressure. Okay, next question. What is the mechanism of action of the surfactant? Okay, so a short note ketangana, you should be able to write what is the mechanism of action of this surfactant. Remember guys, surfactant is going to break the structure of water in your alveoli. In your alveoli, when the water forms, uh, okay, there is going to be a water that is your alveolar fluid. So when this alveolar fluid comes from water, okay, it's going to be forming a surface with the air. The water molecules on the surface of alveoli is going to have a strong attraction to one another. So if they are going to pull together, they are going to form a layer and they prevent the air exchange in your alveoli. So the surfactant is amphipathetic in nature. What is amphipathic? Hydrophobic on one end, hydrophobic on other end, hydrophilic on other end. So in the cohesive force that is going to be, be there between your water molecule is very, very low. Up in the force you wanted to break. Who is going to break the force? The surfactant. So surfactant is going to break the attracting force between the water molecules lining your alveoli. So in the water molecules is going to give you surface tension. When you're going to break this water force between the water molecules, you can divide it and thus it reduces the surface tension. So remember guys, the stability of the alveoli is going to be maintained by your surfactant. So your surfactant is the one that is going to maintain surfactant is the one Okay, is the one that is going to maintain the alveolar stability. This is your alveoli. See, so alveoli without a surfactant, what happens? There is going to be a cohesive force between your water molecules. But when the surfactant is going to come and play a role, that is going to divide your water molecules so that there is going to be a gas exchange occurring in your lungs. So that is the importance of the surfactants in your uh, gas exchange. Okay. See, when there is an increase in the alveolar space by surfactant, this reduces the tendency to recoil. Thus, it does not collapse easily. So, what happens when the this is going to be a diabetic mother? I told you that diabetic mother is a risk factor for uh, decreased surfactant in the baby. Why? Because, very simple concept, in the mother, there is going to be inadequate insulin because of the diabetic nature. So that what happens, there is going to be increase in the glucose level in the plasma of mother. That same uh, plasma is going to get uh, into the fetus. 
அப்ப ஃபீட்டஸ்ல குளுக்கோஸ் லெவல் நிறைய இருக்கும் அப்ப அந்த இம்மெச்சூர் பேங்க்ரியாஸ் வில் பி ஓவர் ஸ்ட்ரெயின் அண்ட் செக்ரீட்டிங் இன்சுலின் சோ பிகாஸ் ஆஃப் தட் வாட் ஆப்பன்ஸ் இட் அஃபெக்ட்ஸ் யுவர் சர்ஃபேஸ் சர்ஃபெக்ட் அண்ட் ப்ரோட்டீன் சிந்தசிஸ் சர்ஃபெக்ட் அண்ட் சிந்தசிஸ் டிக்ரீஸ் ஆகும் போது ஆட்டோமேட்டிக்லி தட் இஸ் கோயிங் டு cause decrease surfactant and the risk of respiratory distress syndrome okay so now after completing about the surfactant we are moving towards the muscles that are going to be involved in the respiration see there are some different muscles that are going to be playing a major role in respiration so first we will divide it into three primary inspiratory muscle accessory inspiratory muscle and accessory expiratory muscle so inspiration expiration rendu da so inspiration is a passive process you don't need any energy for it but expiration ku you need energy that is why copd la problem agara main problem enna na in a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease it is not the patient is unable to take in oxygen but the pay people is unable to let the carbon dioxide go out so and the expiration work agada da copd la problem okay va so primary inspiratory muscles you are going to have diaphragm and external intercostal muscle ivanga rendu perum primary act pandranga they don't require energy accessory inspiratory muscles yaar sternocleidomastoid scalene alenesi and small muscles of head and neck then you have accessory expiratory muscles what are the expiratory muscles internal intercostal muscle rectus abdomini internal and external obliques and your transverse abdominals so just tell me the answer for this athlete running a 10 km marathon which muscles will be used for expiration so now only you saw what are the muscles of expiration okay tell me what are the muscles of expiration see the answer is here again i am showing this table that is the importance of this table guys the importance of table is accessory expiratory muscle can be asked as a separate question internal intercostal muscle rectus abdominis internal and external oblique and transverse abdominis these are the four muscles which are going to be acting as a accessory expiratory muscle i want you all to take a screenshot of this and keep so that it will be helping you next second next question intrapleural pressure can someone tell me what is intrapleural pressure it's a one liner what is a intrapleural pressure intrapleural pressure na na simple intrapleural pleural pressure is a between your uh, pleura there is going to be a fluids that fluids are going to exert some pressure and this fluids will always be negative i told you in the beginning right when we are discussing about the pressure trans pulmonary pressure when you are going to discuss about the trans mural pressure i was telling you intra pleural pressure will always be negative except at the forced expiration why this exception i'll tell you while during inspiration what happens when you are going to begin your inspiration almost minus 3 to minus 4 cm of water or you can have it in a millimeter of mercury minus 2.5 is going to be there and when you are going to inspire when you are going to inspire the intra pleural pressure will be moving further negative to minus 6 mm of mercury but while you are expiring when you are going to forcefully expire there is going to be a control of your expiratory muscles this expiratory muscles when they are going to act they are going to cause your uh, thoracic cage to move outside because of that what happens thoracic cage or movement irukkanaala there is going to be a positive change in the intra pleural pressure in the in other sense it will always remain negative and this is a one single picture i want you all to take a screenshot and keep this will be helping you to define all the pressure see this is your parietal pleura and you are going to have a visceral pleura okay so between your parietal pleura and visceral pleura you are going to have a pleural cavity this pleural cavity is going to have a pressure intra pleural pressure which is going to be almost or approximate a minus 4 mm of mercury then you are going to have the trans pulmonary pressure i told you right it is a pressure difference between your inside cavity and outside cavity that is going to be intra alveolar pressure is inside you are going to have your intra pleural pressure outside so difference between the intra alveolar pressure and intra pleural pressure is going to give you 760 minus 756 Four millimeter of mercury. What is the trans pulmonary pressure? It is going to be approximately four millimeter of mercury. That is going to be approximately four millimeter of mercury. After completing all these things, next we are going to move towards our very important topics. That is going to be spaces. Okay, you are going to have different spaces. Okay, for example, you are going to have anatomical dead space. 
what is anatomical dead space your conducting zone is called as anatomical dead space your conducting zone is called as anatomical dead space anatomical dead space anatomical anatomical dead space Okay, then you are going to have second important space that is called as alveolar dead space. So first one, anatomical dead space, anatomical dead space number one. And number two, you are going to have a second one, apparatus dead space, apparatus dead space. Dead space can be asked as a, to a short note question, apparatus dead space. Then third one is going to be your alveolar dead space, alveolar dead space alveolar dead space and fourth one is going to be your physiological dead space physiological dead space okay physiological dead space so what is going to be your physiological dead space anatomical dead space is like another we will see one by one okay shall we see one by one till now if you have any doubt you can put it in the chat box okay or else we can just move okay you're going to have physiological dead space number one so when this space will be increasing we have to know when the space will be decreasing we have to know and how we will be measuring these spaces so how you are going to measure these spaces three things we have to understand okay basically three things you need to understand okay what are the three things which you are going to understand number one we need to understand when the spaces will be increasing number two when the spaces will be decreasing and number three what how we are going to measure it okay so anatomical dead space so anatomical dead space na, na, it is nothing but your upper airway it is nothing but upper airway okay it is nothing but upper airway so when there is going to be increase in the upper airway when you are going to do a neck extension when you're going to do a neck extension when you're going to chin lift when you're going to lift the chin or when you're going to do bronchodilators when you're going to give bronchodilators these are the one which are going to increase the anatomical dead space and how you will decrease the anatomical dead space by flexion of neck by flexion of neck and bronchoconstriction bronco constriction and how you are going to measure this this is going to be asked as a question for you nitrogen wash n2 washout method what is this n2 washout method called as fowler's method we call it as fowler's method we call it as fowler's method just name is enough understand it it's called as fowler's method next you are going to have your apparatus dead space what is apparatus dead space it is external tubings so when you are going to connect the patient to the ventilators when you are going to connect the patient to the niv circuit so ungalora icu la you will be seeing a mask right mask la or circuit pogum adu ventilator niv ku la pogum external tubing to niv okay non invasive ventilations and the my ventilate pannum bodu anga or space irukku parunga adu add on pannona we call it as apparatus dead space so this is mainly like uh, when you're going to have this external tubing oru vela nama enna pandrona tracheostomy pandrom patient what is tracheostomy you would have seen in the vijay movie right so what you will be doing you will cut in the throat so mersel padathula vandu throat la cut panni enna pannuva oru idu potu respir pannuva that is uh, unethical method of tracheostomy but anyway tracheostomy ipodiki mind la adana vechukonga so appa enna aguna ungaloda area so ungaloda from your nose to your trachea and the area minus agudhu appa enna agum apparatus dead space oda level kammi agum so when you are going to put a laryngeal mask when you are going to put a laryngeal mask or when you are going to put a et tube when you're going to put et tube in all these conditions what happens there is going to be decrease in the there is going to be decrease in the uh, dead space that is called as apparatus dead space a decrease pandrathu okay idha nama measure la panna mudiyad next you are going to have is alveolar dead space yes in alveola itself you are going to have certain dead spaces what are those dead space number 1 when there is going to be a pulmonary thromboembolism okay pulmonary thromboembolism or whenever they see remember alveolar dead space always it is going to be zero so alveolar illa dead space e irukka koodadu alveolar should be fully it should be able to uh, involve in the gas exchange but alveolar illa eppa there will be a dead space when there is pulmonary thromboembolism when there is going to be a severe pulmonary stenosis severe pulmonary stenosis or third condition when there is going to be a 
severe right ventricular failure. In these conditions, you are going to have an alveolar dead space. Now, how are you going to measure this alveolar dead space? So, alveolar dead space is measured. How? You are going to measure it by physiological dead space minus okay, anatomical dead space. So, this physiological dead space minus anatomical dead space should always be equal to zero. So, ideally, it should be always equal to zero. But in case of these three conditions, your alveoli la vandha pathena sila alveoli thrombus vandha thrombus means ana or platelet aggregation so and the platelet aggregation fibrin aggregation is going to come and block your alveoli so that there is no exchange of air in your severe pulmonary stenosis your vessels are short so that and the vessel stenosis aganal anga exchange of gas nadakkala in right ventricular failure so in all these conditions there is going to be a alveolar dead space similarly you are going to have physiological dead space what is physiological dead space anatomical dead space anatomical dead space plus alveolar dead space alveolar dead space but this can be measured how we are going to measure again by using carbon dioxide washout method carbon dioxide washout method this is called as bohr's method this is called as bohr's method so in the end vision you know what you know okay so anatomical dead space measure under the nitrogen washout n2 washout other name one the fowler's method physiological dead space is done by carbon dioxide washout method that is going to be called as bohr's method that is called as bohr's method now we are going to move into this uh, wonderful graphs so in in the edathu anda sir confusion e aarambikidu endha book eduthalum indha graphs enala interpret panna mudiyala appadi nanichinga na this session is going to help you a lot at the end of the discussion in next uh, 15 minutes it is going to be helping you to actually understand all these uh, graphs okay so this is the normal inspiration and normal expiration guys so normal inspiration normal expiration normal inspiration normal expiration can you see here can you just understand so normal inspiration normal expiration so in in the increase agum bodu there is going to be inspiration decrease agum bodu there is going to be expiration ipo oru problem illa but suddenly what you are doing you are forcefully inspiring appa idu da vandu this is called as forceful inspiration forceful inspiration okay va so this is called as forceful inspiration you are going to forcefully inspire adukapra nee enna pandra na you are forcefully expiring forcefully expiring forceful expiration okay va so ipa idu varaiku if you are going to understand now we will be labeling them so now what we are going to do is we are going to label all these uh, graphs okay so normal inspiration normal expiration சோ அப்ப இந்த மாதிரி போகும்போது நார்மலா ஒரு இன்ஸ்பயர் பண்றீங்க நார்மலா எக்ஸ்பயர் பண்றீங்க அப்ப த வால்யூம் ஆஃப் ஆக் இன்ஸ்பயர் டியூரிங் அ நார்மல் குவயட் இன்ஸ்பிரேஷன் சோ நார்மல் குவயட் இன்ஸ்பிரேஷன்ல அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர் யூ கோயிங் டு இன்ஸ்பயர் யூ கால் இட் அஸ் அ டைடல் வால்யூம் சி எ திஸ் இஸ் கால்ட் அஸ் டைடல் வால்யூம் சோ இந்த வால்யூம் அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் ஆர் யூ கோயிங் டு இன்ஸ்பயர் அட் த நார்மல் okay normal quiet respiration appa evlo amount of air inspire pandreengalo that is called as tidal volume clear ah now you are going to forcefully expire right so you are going sorry you are going to forcefully inspire so ninga respiration appa forceful inspiration pandreenga by using your uh, muscles appa enna aguna the highest amount of air that is going to inspire forcefully above your tidal volume so tidal volume gadu normal ah ninga inspire pandra air adha taandi highest a evlo amount of air you can inspire and the air oda amount da inspiratory reserve volume now you are clear right second thing we are saying inspiratory reserve volume what is inspiratory reserve volume amount of air you are going to inspire above the tidal volume above your tidal volume amount of air you are going to inspire that is called as inspiratory reserve volume number 2 when you are going to add this tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume what you are going to get is inspiratory capacity so total amount of air you can inspire that is called as inspiratory capacity moonu formula clear ah ipa in the in tidal volume eppadi measure pannalam spirometry so how you are going to measure this tidal volume by using spirometry number 1 okay va spirometry number 2 how you are going to measure this inspiratory reserve volume again by the help of 
spirometry again by the help of spirometry then you have a inspiratory capacity how are you going to measure this inspiratory capacity inspiratory capacity just add panikonga inspiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume clear off now now what you are going to do is you are going to forcefully expire so nama inspire panadhu poga ipa nama enna pandrom you are going to forcefully expire so appa what normal expiration irukku pathinga adhu vandu tidal volume la irangidum but forceful expire pannum bodu the amount of air that can be maximum let out outside your lungs by forceful expiration you call it as a expiratory reserve volume so amount of air that can be expired forcefully over and after tidal expiration so tidal volume minus panni the amount of air you are going to expire out you call it as expiratory reserve volume but நீ ஃபோர்ஸ்ஃபுல்லாக எக்ஸ்பயர் பண்ணாலும் உன் லங்கை வந்து கொலாப்ஸ் ஆகாமல் பார்த்துக்கணும் அப்போ கொலாப்ஸ் ஆகாமல் பார்த்துக்கிறதுக்காக அவன் லங்ஸில் இன்னரண்டாக தேர் வில் பி சம் வால்யூம் தேர் வில் பி வால்யூம் தட் வில் பி ரிமைனிங் இன் த லங் அட் த என் ஆஃப் ஃபோர்ஸ்ஃபுல் எக்ஸ்பிரேஷன் ஓகேவா ஃபோர்ஸ்ஃபுல்லாக நீ எக்ஸ்பயர் பண்ணிட்டா கூட அட் த எண்டில் யூ ஆர் கோயிங் டு ஹவ் சம் வால்யூம் ஆஃப் ஹேர் லெஃப்ட் இன் சைட் யுவர் லங் that is called as residual volume that is called as residual volume now when you are going to add this expiratory reserve volume and residual volume the thing you are going to get is functional residual capacity abadina enna volume of air that is going to remain functional residual capacity na volume of air that is going to remain when entire air is let out entire air inside your lungs is let out the amount of air that is going to be present inside your lung that is called as functional residual capacity appa now you know what is inspiratory capacity now you know what is functional residual capacity ipa in the functional residual capacity expiratory reserve volume residual volume idala eppadi calculate pandrathu residual volume you can calculate by two method number 1 helium dilution method helium dilution technique or you can go for n2 wash method wash out method what is n2 wash out method called as fowler's method or you can go for body plethysmography okay va second thing is expiratory reserve volume idha vandha nama you are going to measure by spirometry itself you are going to measure this by spirometry itself அப்ப தேர்ட் ஒன் யூ கோயிங் டு ஹவ் ஃபங்க்ஷனல் ரெசிடிவல் கெபாசிட்டி அவ் யூ கோயிங் டு மெஷர் திஸ் அகைன் சேம் டெக்னிக் ஈலியம் டைல்யூஷன் நைட்ரஜன் வாஷ் அவுட் சோ அதுவுமே இதே மெத்தட்ஸ் வச்சு தான் யூ கோயிங் டு யூ கோயிங் டு ஃபைன் நவ் யூ கோயிங் டு ஹவ் த்ரீ மோர் வால்யூம்ஸ் லெஃப்ட் அவுட் ஓகே வாட் ஆர் தோஸ் த்ரீ மோர் வால்யூம் நம்பர் ஒன் vital capacity what is this vital capacity volume of air expired after forceful inspiration appa forceful inspiration appa you are going to have tidal volume you are going to have a inspiratory reserve volume that is called as inspiratory capacity pa in the inspiratory capacity oda seethu expiratory reserve volume adhaadu amount of air you have forcefully expired so amount of air you forcefully inspired amount of air you are going to forcefully expire rendu thiy add panna you will get vital capacity okay then what is residual volume i told you already what is residual volume now adding this vital capacity and your residual volume together gives you this total lung capacity what is the total lung capacity guys total lung capacity is 6 liters now comes the numerical so total lung capacity is 6 liters vital capacity is going to be 5 liter and residual volume is always 1 liter approximately functional residual capacity functional residual capacity is 1 plus 5 liters okay 1 plus inge vandu or 1.5 irukum so 2.5 liters vandu functional residual capacity in expiratory reserve volume this is your expiratory reserve volume that amounts for 1.5 liters and your tidal volume is going to be 500 ml tidal volume is going to be 500 ml and what is going to be your inspiratory reserve volume that is going to be around 3 liters so what is inspiratory capacity 3 liters plus 1.5 liters that is going to be 3 liters plus 1, 500 ml that is going to be 3.5 liters inspiratory capacity is going to be 3.5 liters this is what the entire map is telling so it is easy it is difficult to anime anime i think this is going to be a very easy topic okay anime idla bayapadave vena it's going to be easy total lung or tidal volume is going to be i told you it is going to be around uh, 500 ml inspiratory reserve volume is going to be around 2.5 to 
3 liter. When you have expiratory reserve volume, it is going to be around 1 to 1.1 liter. Residual volume 1 to 1.1 to 1.2 liter. This is confused. Okay, let's keep it very simple. Okay, let's keep it very simple. So, I have given you all the values. In the values, that is more than enough. And we have, we have calculations, everything we discussed. Now, we are moving into the elastance and compliance. So, what is compliance? How easy it is to expand? So, rumba simple on a word la solna, compliance na, how easy it is going to expand? It is to expand your lungs. Expand your lungs. So, that is what we are going to discuss under the heading compliance. What is elastance? Elastance is nothing but, write it down guys, this is the definition, tendency to get back, okay, to Original resting shape. Original resting shape on removal of deforming force. On removal of deforming force. That is called as your elastance. Now, what is your compliance? Compliance now, it's all about changes that is going to occur in your lung volume. How easy it is to expand your lung. So, compliance is nothing but it is equal to change in the volume divided by change in the pressure. So, compliance is nothing but change in the volume divided by change in the pressure gives you compliance. Okay. Normal lung compliance. Normal lung compliance is equal to 100 to 400 ml per centimeter of water. Okay. It's going to be 100 to 400 ml per centimeter of water. Now, you need to understand. Okay. Before moving into that, we will just discuss. See this case scenario. 22 year old woman, she is going to have a pulmonary compliance of 0.2 liter per centimeter of water. Alveolar pressure is going to be 4 centimeter of water at the beginning of inspiration. And she is going to inhale 600 ml of alveolar air. That is going to be uh, your volume of air she is going to inspire. What is the transpulmonary pressure? So, transpulmonary pressure, we already know the definition. Alveolar pressure minus intrapleural pressure. So, compliance kurthirukkaanga. So, 0.2 liter per, per centimeter of water. That is nothing but 200 ml per centimeter of water. Okay. Up 200 ml per centimeter of water can actually give one negative pressure. So, it is going to give a neg pressure of one. Okay, so it's going to give a pressure of 1. A pair, 600 ml can give a pressure of Evlo. 0.200 ml, it's going to give 1. Na. 600 ml gives 3, okay, it's going to give 3 units of pressure. And it's a negative pressure. Now, after you're going to inhale, what is you're going to have? So, you're going to have pulmonary alveolar pressure. It is a constant 4 minus of minus 3. That is a negative pressure. That is your transpulmonary pressure. It gives you 7 centimeter of water. Now, the answer for this question. Now, see. Now, the answer for this question. What is the answer for this question, guys? Okay. The 22-year-old woman, you transpulmonary pressure. The answer is 7 centimeter of water. Now, we are moving towards this lung compliance. Now, we are going to move towards this important concept, lung compliance. Let me tell you about this lung compliance. So now if a compliance na enna nama paathito, how what is the compliance? Increase the it's a ratio between the change in volume and change in the pressure. Now you need to understand. Now you need to understand one important thing. In which all concepts, in which all conditions, you are going to have an increase in the lung compliance. So increase in the lung compliance. In the condition, lung compliance will be increased. Okay. This is asked as a short note. Okay. This can be asked as a short note question. You need to understand. Remember, breakdown of elastin. Number one, when the elastin breaks down. Elastin break. So, elastin break. So, usually, there has to be a movement forward and backward. But elastin da, in the elasticity da, enna pannadhi, it is going to bring back to the resting state. So that is when you are going to inspire, your volume is going to increase. Your shape of your lung is going to increase. But when you are going to expire out, it is going to return back to the normal position, right? Your lungs. But when the elastin is going to be broken down, what happens? There is no tendency to 
come back to the normal resting state after removing the deforming pores because of which what happens is there is going to be increase in the volume increase in the volume you know that compliance is nothing but volume by pressure appa compliance is nothing but volume by pressure so volume vandu pathinga increased ave irukum volume vandu pathinga increased ave irukum elastin break aachuna so appa enna agum breakdown elastin aachuna lung oda compliance increase agum what are the conditions number 1 old age Number one, old age. Number two, when there is a emphysema, when you are going to have a emphysema. So, in a old age, you will have a terminology called as barrel shaped chest. Barrel shaped chest. This barrel shaped chest is going to increase the lung compliance. This is going to be the first one. Next, in what conditions your lung compliance, lung compliance is going to decrease. Lung compliance is going to decrease. Remember, lung compliance will be decreasing in following condition. One, when there is a rib fracture, when you are going to have a rib fracture, when there is going to be a kyphosis, when there is going to be kyphosis, when there is going to be a scoliosis when there is going to be scoliosis when there is going to be dystrophies when there is going to be a muscle dystrophy okay va when there is going to be a respiratory muscle dystrophy respiratory muscle dystrophy okay dystrophy of respiratory muscle respiratory muscle when there is going to be a myasthenia gravis myasthenia gravis okay when there is going to be a neuromuscular junction so id ellame already covered in nerve muscle physiology guys myasthenia gravis nerve muscle physiology la cover panirukom neuromuscular junction again we covered so all these conditions what happens they are going to restrict your airway they are going to restrict your airway therefore there is decrease in the lung compliance okay va wow. similarly you have some pleural factors similarly what happens you also have some pleural factors what are the pleural factors that is going to decrease the lung compliance okay write it down guys this is a important short note number 1 there is going to be some inflammation when there is some inflammation of pleura inflammation of pleura what is inflammation of pleura called as pleuritis inflammation of pleura is called as pleuritis number 2 when there is a pleural effusion when there is going to be a pleural effusion number 3 when there is going to be rise in the intrapleural pressure when there is going to be rise in the intrapleural pressure intrapleural pressure okay va wow. in all these conditions there is going to be a decrease in the lung compliance and number 3 write it down parenchymal problem parenchymal abnormalities lung parenchymal irukra abnormalities so number 1 when there is a interstitial lung disease okay when there is going to be a lung fibrosis when there is going to be a lung fibrosis or when there is going to be a silicosis when there is going to be a silicosis asbestosis and the all the uh, conditions okay va pneumoconiosis nu solluvom and the pneumoconiosis la irukkoodiya ella conditions so they will cause a decrease so in the conditions ellame we call it as a restrictive disease we call it as restrictive disease now you have told a term called as restrictive disease so we are going to go into the lung compliance can you see here this is your lung compliance diagram which is given in your gaiten textbook so in the lung compliance diagram let me simplify okay va so there are two diagrams one air filled ah irundha eppadi irukum saline filled ah irundha eppadi irukum indha rendu question ungalku kuduthirupanga indha lung filled ah irukku la air filled lungs indha indha graph we call it as hysteresis we call it as hysteresis so what is hysteresis it is the difference between the curve of inflation can you see it this is the curve of inflation that is going to be your inspiration okay va to the deflation so it is hysteresis na na it is nothing but is a difference between the cause of between the curve of inspiration that is going to be inflation and the curve of deflation okay in the pressure volume curve of the lung pressure volume curve of the lung this is called as hysteresis so idu or two mark question ah ketittirundanga munadi what is hysteresis it is a difference between the curve of inflation and deflation in the pressure volume curve now two marks are not there but again they are giving you as a sub question in your essays so adinala again you it is important to learn all these two marks also for your exam so that when it is going to be given as a subdivision question you will be able to answer it okay now beginning of inspiration what happens your lung volume is less 
so beginning of inspiration la enna nadakkudhu just see okay beginning of inspiration lung volume is going to be less intra intermolecular force is going to be more and the surface density surfactant or the density kammiya irukum because of this what happens there is going to be increased surface tension because of increased surface tension compliance is going to be less because your compliance is less you will get a flat curve okay you will get a flat curve so can you see here so i'll show you see here can you see here? this is some flat curve you are going to have in the starting so starting low or flat curve iruk why because you there is going to be increase in the surface tension because of that there is a com less compliance because of that you will have a flat curve now what happens as the inspiration continues as the inspiration continues surface density is going to rise surfactant or density rise agumbodu surface tension will be decreasing because of that what happens again your compliance will be raised when the compliance is raised what happens slope is also going to raise now you will be able to understand okay so previously can you see now the slope slowly raises during your inspiration so once there is going to be at the end of inspiration what happens so there is going to be beginning of expiration but even though beginning of expiration la vandu ungalku lung volume konja konjama increase aanalum air vella ponadanal lung volume increase aanalum intermolecular force decrease aanalum your surfactant clearance is not in the same rate of lung volume decrease agra alavukku so lung volume decrease agra alavukku air vella pombodhu lung volume decrease agum அந்த டிக்ரீஸ் ஆகிற அளவுக்கு உங்க சர்ஃபெக்டன் கிளியரன்ஸ் ஆகல அதனால சர்ஃபெக்டன்டோட டென்சிட்டி ரிமைன்ஸ் சேம் அதனால கம்ப்ளையன்ஸ் இஸ் கோயிங் டு கண்டினியூ டு பி மோர் ஓகே யுவர் கம்ப்ளையன்ஸ் இஸ் கோயிங் டு கண்டினியூ டு பி மோர் ஸோ இப்ப பாத்தீங்கன்னா அதனாலதான் ஸோ தெர் இஸ் அ ஸ்லோ டிக்ரீஸ் ஸோ ஒன்ஸ் அட் திஸ் ஸ்டேஜ் வாட் ஆப்பன்ஸ் யுவர் சர்ஃபெக்டன் டென்சிட்டி இஸ் கோயிங் டு டிக்ரீஸ் so when the surfactant density is going to decrease what happens there is a straight line so there is a complete decrease so there is going to be a complete decrease in the volume there is going to be complete decrease in the volume so that is what happens when the surfactant removed from your liquid lining density remains constant so the compliance is going to remain somewhat constant at the middle stage but it is going to slowly decrease the volume slowly decrease the volume so this is your chest wall compliance and this is the comb you are going to have a lung compliance this is your lung compliance this is your chest wall compliance together you are going to have a combined compliance that is going to be in this shape okay so what happens when there is going to be a you can have two type of diseases one we have obstructive lung disease obstructive lung disease in one we can have is a restrictive lung disease restrictive lung disease so restrictive lung disease la enna agum amount of air that is going to enter into itself is going to be more amount of air that is going to be enter inside itself is going to be more okay va so normal air la enna agum unga surfactant inge irukadunala that is going to bring it to the normal hysteresis curve but when there is going to be emphysema what is emphysema and what is fibrosis which is the obstructive disease and which is the restrictive disease can someone tell me emphysema is obstructive disease or restrictive disease emphysema is obstructive disease or restrictive disease can someone put in the chat box guys emphysema is a obstructive disease the fibrosis is a restrictive disease fibrosis is a restrictive disease so remember so what happens basically is remember guys so in emphysema there is going to be obstructive lung disease since you have a obstructive lung disease what happens there is going to be a raise there is going to be a uh, increase uh, in the amount of lung volume that will be entering you know ungalku forcefully ninga expire pananum obstruction irukadanal so nariya amount of air will be entering ஓகே ஃபைப்ரோசிஸ்ல என்ன ஆகும்னா லங் வால்யூமே லங்ஸே சுருங்கி இருக்கும் அதனால அமௌண்ட் ஆஃப் வால்யூம் தட் இஸ் கோயிங் பிரசன்ட் இன் த லங் வில் பி லோ ஈவன் தோ யூ கிவ் லாட்ஸ் ஆஃப் ப்ரெஷர் ஸோ டிரான்ஸ்பல்மனரி ப்ரெஷர் ரைஸ் ஆகிறதுக்கு இங்கே லேட் ஆகும் பிகாஸ் ஆஃப் அப்ஸ்ட்ரக்ஷன் பட் லங் வால்யூம் வில் பி மோர் பட் ஆப்போசிட் இன் ஃபைப்ரோசிஸ் வாட் ஆப்பன்ஸ் யுவர் லங் வால்யூம் வில் பி லெஸ் வேர் ஆஸ் யுவர் ட்ரான் ஈவன் தோ யூ கிவ் சோ மச் ஆஃப் ப்ரெஷர் த லங் வால்யூம் வில் பி மோ லெஸ் ஓகே நவ் கம்மிங் பேக் டு திஸ் வண்டர்ஃபுல் டேபிள் this will be helping you for revision this table i want you all to draw it and write it down in your notes okay what happens we will take some case what we will take some scenarios okay va at low lung volume number 1 okay for we have to discuss about when there is a low lung volume number 2 when there is a i lung volume when there is a i lung volume when there is i lung volume okay va when there is i lung volume 
Number three, when there is, it is going to be at the functional residual capacity. When it is going to be at the functional residual capacity. My God, this itself is going to kill. One minute, sorry guys. See, at low, at low lung volume, okay, at high lung volume, number three, at functional residual capacity, number four, hysteresis, hysteresis seen. I want you all to copy this, hysteresis is seen. And when will be the hysteresis absent? When you will have this hysteresis absent? And what is the reason of absence? Reason of absence. These all questions, we are going to cover it in one single table. At low lung volume, what happens? You are going to have a chest wall. Okay. This chest wall is going to give you this trans pulmonary pressure. Trans pulmonary pressure, right? So, at low lung volume, what happens? You will have a reduced surface tension and increased compliance. Okay, ma? increased compliance. You know, you know, the amount of area, surface area will be less, surface tension will be less, so compliance will be more. At high lung volume, what happens? There is going to be raise in the surface tension. This will be decreasing your compliance. Do you all agree? Compliance. Very good, uh, neat aspirant to MBBS student. I don't know your name. Very good. Pa. So next is going to be at functional residual capacity. So functional residual capacity in the rind period balance no. it has to balance the recoiling force of your chest wall. So this side you're going to have your chest wall and this side you're going to have a lung. So at functional residual capacity, there has to be a balancing force. There has to be a balancing force. Okay. This balancing force chest wall more than your, okay. And more than your lungs. So this is how your forces will be. Hysteresis in the scene, we can see now, air-filled lungs, like you can see, air-filled lungs. So this is asked as a one mark question, MCQ guys, MCQ, MCQ, all these three things are previous MCQs in your question papers. Hysteresis is seen in the air-filled lungs, okay, hysteresis is absent in the saline-filled lungs, saline-filled lungs. Now tell me, what is the reason of your hysteresis? In your fluid filled, when there is going to be fluid filled area, that is going to cause raise in the surface tension and decrease in the compliance. Okay, that is going to cause absence of your hysteresis, absence of your hysteresis. Okay, this is what I want you all to remember. Okay, this is what I want you all to remember. Now we are moving towards the next important table or concept when we have ventilation perfusion. What is ventilation perfusion? We will go till 11 o'clock. Okay, at 11 we will be closing. So ventilation of it is the air entry or exit. That is ventilation. So our window ventilate. What is that air entry and air exit? What is perfusion? Blood flow. Okay, blood flow to lungs. So blood flow to lungs is nothing but your perfusion. So what happens at the, you're going to have four areas of your lungs, apex, then you're going to have your mid zone. You're going to have apex, then you're going to have your mid zone, then you're going to have your base. Okay, so we are going to see what is going to be the dead space at this particular area and what is going to be the shunt that is going to be present. So apex la ventilation is going to be very least. Okay, apex la ventilation kammi or when air when it is going to enter into your lung. See here. So what is the apex base la on mail? So see here. When you're going to have a air, when you're going to have like this. Okay, this is going to be your apex. So this area is called as your apex, and this is called as your base. This is called as your base, and this is going to be your mid zone. Now tell me which area will be having a maximum uh, ventilation. Maximum ventilation is going to be present in the base. In a gravity, in a air is going to go to the base. So maximum ventilation is going to be present in the base and least ventilation will be present in the apex, apex and moderate ventilation will be present in the mid zone. Now coming towards your perfusion. Again, perfusion also will be least in your apex. It will be maximum in your base and it will be moderate in your mid zone. In that case, what will be your ventilation perfusion ratio? In this, in this, what happens? Both your ventilation and your perfusion is low. So, 3.3 is your ventilation perfusion ratio. That is mid zone. moderate. So, around 0.8. These values are very important. And in base, what happens? 
0.6. This is the very least. So maximum ventilation and perfusion occurs in the base, but the ventilation perfusion ratio will be least again in the base. Okay, these two you want to understand. And now coming to the dead space. So dead space normal arco. Okay, wow. in dead space will be not, not normal. In the one, the perfusion is going to be zero. So the, if there's go, when the ventilation is normal and perfusion is going to be zero, normal divided by zero, it is going to be infinite. It's going to be infinite. So ventilation perfusion ratio is infinite. Whereas in your shunt, okay, what happens when there is a shunt? So ventilation will be zero. But perfusion will be good. Blood supply nalla arko, but air entry illa. Appa enna ago? Perfusion zero, ventilation nalarka. Perfusion is going to be very nice, but ventilation illana, you will have zero VQ ratio. Why VQ ratio is important? This is going to determine amount of uh, air exchange occurring in the alveoli. Okay, amount of air exchange occurring in the alveoli. So, if we path the yellow at standing portion. Okay, at standing portion. Now tell me at supine at the supine position, what is going to be your uh, depend? Okay, so it is going to be the dependent region. So you have something called as dependent region. This dependent region will be having more perfusion and it is going to have more ventilation. So supine portion is going to be the one that is going to be having more ventilation and more perfusion. Okay, supine portion is the one that is going to have more ventilation and more. Okay, so that is going to have more ventilation. That is going to have more ventilation and it is going to have more. Okay, perfusion. Okay, so that is what it's important. Okay, I hope you are clear with it. Okay, is everything clear, right? Okay, so next we are going to move towards a uh, very important concept. So again, this is going to be the difference between the obstructive and restrictive lung disease. Next 10 minutes, we will be discussing about this obstructive and restrictive lung disease and that graph flow volume graph. This is a confusing topic. So I'll complete this confusing topic also today. Okay, wow. what is the force uh, obstructive versus restrictive lung disease? So you're going to have thing called as obstructive disease. So see here. Okay, so you're going to have two important diseases, obstructive disease and you have restrictive disease. Obstructive disease now some airway obstruction, some airway obstruction. Examples and someone give me number one, asthma, COPD. Your lung parenchyma is normal. Lung parenchyma is going to be remaining normal. Okay, whereas in restrictive lung diseases, what happens? There is going to be a impairment in the lung expansion. Impairment in lung expansion. Lung expansion. There is an impairment in the lung expansion. So there is going to be difficulty in inspiration. Difficulty in inspiration. There is going to be difficulty in inspiration itself. Now you want to understand this very important graph. Okay, so in the graph of Bukla Pathonia, we will be like very confused how to understand this graph. We will be thinking, right? I'll explain you how to understand this graph very easily. See here. So what happens is you're going to have this one thing called as FEV1. What is this FEV1? FEV1. What is this? FEV9. First, FEV is forced expiratory, expiratory volume, forced expiratory volume in one second. What is FEV1? Forced expiratory volume in one second. So normally what happens? 80% of your vital capacity, 80% of your vital capacity is let out. Okay. That is called as your forced expiratory volume. Up as simpler terms when you can put FEV1 will be divided by your functional vital capacity will be equal to. So when you're going to keep it as five, five parts, no change, no? four parts will be let out. That is going to be around 0.8. Upper normal FEV1, normal FEV1 is going to be 0.8. Is it clear till now? The, I think this will be helping you first understand this concept. Once you understand this concept, now tell me in an obstructive lung disease, in an obstructive lung disease, what happens? Okay, in an obstructive lung disease, so you have a parent came on Upper lungs kula air fill agarla in the problem illa, but in the pathway is obstructed, therefore it will take more time to enter into the lung. But the more amount on the full volume of amount on will be entering inside your lung. Okay, so up in a normal patient, when you can enter into the lung at four seconds, 
at the normal patient if you can enter into the lung at 4 seconds okay 4 uh, 4 now and almost fev 1 not 1 second how many amount of volume of uh, uh, volume of air you can inspire so at the function uh, volume of air you can inspire okay forced expiratory volume sorry forced expiratory volume amount of air you can expire at the end of 1 second that is going to be 4 liters okay 4 liters you can expire out easily if a normal individual irunda but what happens in your obstructive lung diseases like COPD? So, you can expire easily because there is some obstruction. If you expiration easily because of some obstruction, na, what happens? What happens? What you want to understand? So, it will take time. It will take more time. But ultimately, it will give all the flow, uh, air outside. So, can you see here? It is going to give all the functional volume of cap cap vital capacity outside, but it takes time. Upon the Naraya time, at the end of one second, only one liter of air is let out. So, normal people love four liters has to get out, but in him, in, in what happened? Only one liter gets out. This is in obstructive lung disease. What happens in your restrictive disease? Restrictive disease law, what happens is, yes, we agree that FEV1 will not be that much worse because FEV1 FEV1 amount of volume of air that is going to be forcefully expired out at the end of one second. That will be around 2 to 3 or 2.7 but in the end or important total amount of air inside your lungs itself is going to be 3 liters only. 3 liter like 80% it is going to let out at one second correct 2.7 it is letting out but 2.7 divided by 3 around 90% around 90% came out around 90% came out of your lungs Apa what is forced expiratory capacity and the volume in one second or the normal ratio so no 0.8 or 80% of vital capacity Inge can you see 90% of air came out of your lung 90% of air came out of your lung at the one second but in a sense the total amount of volume of air that is present in the lungs itself is low adhuve kamiya irukkaradunala inge vandu pathinga na you are going to have a Okay, normal FEV ratio. Apa FEV 1 divided by FVC, okay, is going to be more than 0.8, more than here equal to 0.8. But what happens in the obstructive lung disease? FEV 1 divided by FVC is going to be less than 0.8 or less than 80 percentage. Now, can you understand why you mentioned that in the how to differentiate between the obstructive and restrictive lung diseases by using this FEV1? FEV1, in the condition, okay, FEV1 will be normal. FEV1, okay, FEV1 will be normal or increased in case of restrictive lung diseases. Whereas in obstructive lung diseases, what happens? FEV1 divided by FVC will be less than 0.8. Less than 0.8. That is what this graph is defining you. If you have in the graph, the problem Hopefully, it should not come. This is one of the important MCQ. They can ask you as an important short note. And I hope I have made it simplified. I simplified it. Next one. Now, we are going to move towards the next important thing. What is the next important thing, guys? We are going to discuss about the flow volume curve. Flow volume curve. What is this flow volume curve? So, see here, initial part of your expiratory curve. So, you're going to have, this is your expiratory, this is your inspiratory. The initial part of your expiratory curve tells that it, there is an intactness of proximal airway. So, the initial part of your, okay, initial part of your expiratory curve is going to tell you the intactness, intactness of the proximal airway. Okay, well, proximal airway, that is your trachea and your uh, bronchi. Okay, well, and the distal part in the part regular, that is going to tell the intactness of the media, medium size, medium size, okay, airways, medium size airways. Okay, and alveo, medium size airway and distal airways and, and, and your distal airways. What are these going to consist of? This is going to consist of your alveoli. This is going to consist of your alveolar, ducts, tertiary bronchi and respiratory bronchioles. So, 
first initial time period one the which is going to uh, con which is going to give the intactness of proximal airway later part gives you the intactness of medium size airway and distal airway keela apdiye keela varudhu so expire panni mudichitom volume of air is going to be present inside in the fvc this is going to give you fvc okay va now what happens again you are going to inspire so inspire avumbod you are going to have fif 75 50 25 then finally it is going to reach zero and again there is going to be expiration so in the or circle continue again like this is going to be your flow volume curve what is this flow degree signifies flow signifies the speed of air flow signifies the speed of air now what is the peak expiratory flow rate peak expiratory flow rate what is this pef pef data is the nothing but it is going to access you your muscle strength expiratory muscle strength large airway oda pattern see mainly trachea main bronchi and fef 25 what it is going to denote it is going to denote the medium sized bronchi then you have fef 50 so what is going to be forced expiratory for okay fef 50 oda idu enna solludhu this is going to give you the flow through the small airways like your segmental bronchi bronchiole fef 75 adu edha kurikidu distal airways like your alveolar duct alveoli la so idella edhukku important na m m e f r okay expiratory flow rate at fef 25 so fef 25 la what is going to be the maximum expiratory flow rate idu vandu determine it's going to represent the middle of of your fvc that is going to represent the middle of of fvc this range appears less dependent on patient efforts so it is going to depend on the medium medium sized airways and distal airways oda pattern c so adha da idu ellame kurikidu so adha da all these things are going to show now in a normal lungs in a normal lungs what happens there is going to be a something like this the one given in the black is going to be your normal lungs so what happens in your rest restrictive lung disease restrictive lung disease edu restrictive lung disease idu da ungaloda restrictive lung disease okay so blue color one is going to be your restrictive lung disease in restrictive lung disease what happens the amount of air that is going to enter into enter inside is going to be drastically reduced the amount of air that is going to enter inside is drastically going to get reduced but in a obstructive lung disease enna agum it goes to the other quadrant so idu obstructive lung disease is a obstructive lung disease is respire it is going to be restrictive lung disease so what they can do actually is they can show you some graph like this they can show you some graph like this and they will be asking you to tell what is the disease present in this so this is a normal flow volume loop okay va even there is going to be any obstruction what happens there is going to be a flattening of both inspiration and expiratory flow and there is going to be increase in the fef 50 divided by fef fif 50 ratio this is going to be restrictive rate so when there is going to be fixed obstruction fixed obstruction when there is going to be restrictive lung disease like your interstitial lung disease when there is going to be fibrosis that is going to be like your volume vand decrease aidudhu so the force of inspiring la onnume problem illa breathing and the apparatus is not a problem so expiration inspiration is not a problem but the volume is going to be decrease can you see here volume is decrease but what happens when there is a flow obstruction when there is a flow obstruction volume is going to be happy no problem but ungloda flow expiration oda flow vand kammi agudhu so there is a decrease in the flow but volume remains normal volume remains normal can you see here early airway outflow obstruction la there is going to be a concave upward later la you going to have concave upward or scooped out pattern okay va in a restricted disease la what happens there is going to be a volume decrease there is going to be a volume decrease so i hope so you can understand this concept very well so adukaga i have just compared and shown you okay va i have just compared and shown you now this is very important guys i want you all to take down this table also so i am going to give you certain parameters and difference between the obstructive lung disease and restrictive lung disease obstructive lung disease and restrictive lung disease ah nama differentiate panna porom so with this i will complete for today i think it's going to be a very long discussion but very important topic ana no problem second of i will record and upload it by tomorrow today tomorrow morning so that enna aguna ungal complete respiratory physiology rendu rendu video 2 hours la you can complete it okay va so parameters enna na paaka porom number 1 inspiration okay 
air trapping okay air trapping slow vital capacity slow vc forced okay wow. when there is going to be forced vital capacity fev1 fd irukum fev1 then fev1 divided by fvc fd irukum residual volume residual volume then we are going to talk about the functional residual capacity and total lung capacity see here in obstructive disease total lung capacity remains increased or remains normal but your restrictive disease la lung capacity will be reduced okay va well, fev1 enga reduced a irukum rendu thilume reduced a da irukum but more pronounced in your obstructive lung disease and you already know fev1 divided by fvc ratio this will be more than 0.8 or more than or equal to 0.8 this will be less than 0.7 okay va well, residual volume increased a irukum forced respiratory functional residual capacity will be more adanal da what shape of chest you will have here you will have a barrel shaped chest you have a barrel shaped chest will be there okay va well, inge ellame decreased a da irukum next one inspiration normal a irukum inge so inge endha problem kedaiyad obstructive lung disease la expiration da problem therefore there is going to be air trapping expiration is a problem so air trapping is there inge vandu restrictive la even inspiration is going to be a problem okay inspiration is going to be impaired in this condition it's going to be impaired in this condition so air trapping irukka nu kettingana no air trapping complete volume of air is going to come out okay va well, slow vc okay va well, normal it's going to be normal adey forced da pathingana vital capacity will be low inge rendu me kammiya da irukum okay this table if you are going to write as a difference between obstructive and restrictive in your exam instead of writing those scraps given in your guide books you will be getting good score actually you will be getting good score okay va well, so now its time is uh, 10:52 uh, can someone put in the chat box how was this discussion can we maintain the same pace can we maintain a detailed discussion like this itself so that you will be able to write the exam very well or if you want to give me just the important points and run so that uh, you don't want to have a lengthy discussion but just like a revision you want so you can just comment in the chat box meanwhile okay va well, if you, you can just comment in the chat box so with this we will be completing the today's session and tomorrow okay morning i will be uploading in that you will be discussing about the gas transport we will be discussing about hypoxia and hypoxemia then the neural control of breathing neural control of breathing then we will also discuss about the two important questions which you can have high altitude acclimatization and decompression sickness decompression sickness and we will also see about this periodic breathing like your cane stoke breathing apneustic breathing cluster breathing idala so innum minji pona or 1 hour 45 minutes to 1 hour la we will be able to complete the entire respiratory physiology okay you can just let me know how was the discussion of today okay how was the discussion of today you can let me know so that if you want any improvement any changes we will try to do it okay we will try to do it again repeating so let's uh, i'm just telling you that you have only few more days with you so yeah, now you have to decide which remote you are going to use okay so period uh, timely you can have some entertainment but uh, try to read so that uh, you won't uh, like get completely distracted and you won't lose your exam so ultimate aim of us to is to write exam very well so hope so you all did a uh, you all reading so we will have more discussion so yesterday i started with biochemistry or a part of biochemistry we have completed molecular biology already completed now respiratory physiology we are going to complete already we have completed general physiology nerve muscle physiology and we have completed the body fluid general physiology fully so if you have time kindly go through those topics also it will be helpful for you uh, hematology i will be covering i will be covering renal physiology in uh, coming days so i i'll be covering the cns also so in the coming week i'll cover cns also so the complete physiology you have in your hand and it will help you tremendously for uh, writing your exam well okay sure benila we will have a revision of important questions also so this is uh, yesterday we had very uh, limited uh, topics or discuss so many people asked uh, to cover everything so i today i covered some important topics also so these are all important questions only for your exam so we will make it like a important question based also in the upcoming classes okay thank you so much